public debt and budget deficits in the U.S. Sure, well, in reference to the Robert Fisk article, I'm hearing the same thing here in my contacts in Paris and in the Mideast. So I'm hearing the same story. Uh, what I'm also hearing is that the basket of currencies that will replace the U.S. dollar will be much more heavily weighted in gold bullion. As much as 50 percent of the new currency scheme will be weighted in gold bullion. And the point of all this, keep in mind, is that these countries, China, Russia, and Iran, the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, they've made it really uh, no secret that they hope to take down the U.S. economy and take down the U.S. dollar. And this is a move toward taking down the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy by shifting the way oil is priced out of the world reserve currency, the dollar, which gives America an incredible free pass to finance wars and occupations around the world. China, Iran, and Russia don't want to finance America's military adventures in Afghanistan and Iraq and possibly Iran by allowing the U.S. to have the world's reserve currency, the U.S. dollar, which gives them uh, this, uh, what they call uh, coinage, or um, the ability to make a profit on every single transaction that is done around the world because it's all done in U.S. dollars. So this is really another step toward the U.S. economy collapsing and the U.S. as a major global power collapsing. Well, you said that China and Russia are interested in collapsing the U.S. economy, but those countries, plus Japan and the Gulf states, all hold big dollar reserves. So uh, do you think they're interested in really collapsing the U.S. economy? Yes, well, they're fed up. Uh, first of all, that's why you see the gold price moving up right now. It's hitting new all-time historic highs as a way to hedge against the dollar collapse. They're trying to do it in a way that's slower rather than fast. This is a done deal. It's baked into the cake. The U.S. dollar will no longer be the world reserve currency, certainly by 2018. But I have a feeling, based on what I'm hearing and the information that I have just learned in the last two hours, uh, that this time schedule that Robert Fisk is portraying, 2018, things are going to be happening a lot faster. Well, which currencies do you think then could replace the dollar? Well, as has been mentioned, uh, the, the idea of a basket, a currency basket, uh, they're already talking about this at the G7, the G4, and the G20, and the International Monetary Fund. We just came out of a major uh, G meeting in Pittsburgh, and the topic of discussion was creating a global currency to replace the U.S. dollar as reserve currency. They already are aware of this. They're talking about a special drawing right, which would allow all the currencies to be recalibrated and then redistributed, with the U.S. dollar taking the biggest devaluation of up to 50 percent, I would imagine, going forward, which is about what you would need for the U.S. to come in line with the global economy in terms of the incredible debts that the U.S. is carrying that Asia is financing, that the Mideast is financing, which is one thing. But what they are objecting to, and what I'm hearing from my contacts here in Paris and in the Mideast, is that they don't want to finance America's wars anymore. So what did he just say to us here? <clears throat> I showed that to help it make it simpler, and I think you may be more confused. The way you have to understand the way we function is essentially like a credit card. The United States has this ability to print its own money and set its value. It's like a credit card. In fact, Thomas Harold in, in, a, in a, an article on this just recently said the following. He talked about how the U.S. abuses their place as the reserve currency. He said, uh, excuse me, until the early 1970s, the U.S. loaned out more money to other countries than any other nation on the earth. We were the banker for the world. By the 1980s, we had begun to reverse the trend, becoming a debtor nation. It only took another decade to the 1990s to see the United States evolve into the world's largest debtor. The transformation has been dramatic as the amount of debt that the country has taken on in the wake of the financial crisis and the economic collapse is over $15 trillion. I wish it was just that $15 trillion. There's so much more. <laughs> the only reason that this has been possible is because other countries continuously loan America money at impossibly low interest rates. This is not only the way that the country abuses the status of owning the reserve currency, the United States has also printed money electronically since 2007 
in increasing larger amounts. What do they mean by printing it electronically? Well, only about 15% of U.S. dollars are actually printed. Most of them are just, the Fed says, okay, you have X number more dollars, they just impute it in the computer, it's just digital. And then they begin to buy and sell based upon what's digitally there. It's kind of like my Starbucks app, you know? I just put in there how much money I want, and I, you know, just, it automatically does it for me. I don't have to actually give them money. I think that makes it free. Um, he adds, he says, the shocking truth is that America has more than tripled the amount of dollars in existence in the world in only three to four years. Now, let me see if I can get some of these slides here going. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't even know if these are in order. I'll try to do this right here. Um, what he, we have here is something called hyperinflation. This is a, a Funzig Millionen Mark. 1924 to, 1922 to 1924, the Weimar Republic in Germany tried to address their economic problems by simply printing more marks. It came to a point where they were having marks that people were carrying 15 or, or 50 million marks. In fact, interestingly, people would have to load wheelbarrows up with marks to go buy a loaf of bread. Uh, it was so bad, it was so bad that it wouldn't go on to the next slide. It won't, there we go. Whoops. Here we go. Uh, people literally used it for wallpaper. It was cheaper to use marked notes than it was to actually purchase wallpaper. So what you have to understand is what you do is you, inf you inflate your currency, and when you inflate it, the value goes down. Let me put it into terms that many of us understand. Five, six years ago, we take a trip to Israel, it cost $2,400. Today, we go to Israel, it's the same hotels, the same trip, the same airplanes, everything is the same, the food is the same, nothing any better, it's $3,800. Why is it so much more expensive? Because the value of the currency has depreciated over a third. It's just not worth as much. When you go overseas, they just look at it and go, okay. It used to be a day you pull out a dollar in some country and they just grab it. Now they'll say, do you have euros? Or do you have something? I mean, they're not anxious to have it because they're not sure how stable it's going to be long term. And that goes up and down. Euro's got its own problems right now. We'll talk, talk about that in a moment. But you have to understand, it's like, it's like when you get laid off from your job and you decide that you won't change your standard of living, and so what you'll do is you'll keep your same standard of living using your credit card. But what's the reality of that? Sooner or later, the bank is going to say, we're not going to let you spend this money because we know you can no longer repay all that you've bothered, borrowed. When the United States borrows the kind of money that it borrows today, when you realize 42 cents of every dollar that the U.S. government spends, 42 cents out of every dollar it spends, it borrows from other people. And there comes a point where they say, wait a minute, are you intentionally doing this to escape debt? Well, it'd be interesting because some people believe that's actually the plan. But anyway, let me, before I get ahead of myself, he goes on to say, so far other countries in the grips of devastating financial crisis have grudgingly accepted this practice, although they have complained loudly over it. The day is coming when they will no longer take it. In fact, Washington Times, April 8th, uh, 2008, a meeting of the group of 20, the group of 20 is the 20 largest economies in the world, the governments and, uh, of, of economies. It says, basically, the article says in the Washington Times that they gave, uh, the finance ministers and central bank governors from over 20 economies gave a nod to the idea of a single world currency last week, and other countries such as China are pushing it because they no longer trust the United States to restrain itself from printing too much cash, and debasing the dollar, which is basically one quick way out of debt. I had a gentleman tell me, he says, my parents owned a restaurant in Germany in the 1920s. They sold it for about 160,000 marks, which was a, really a great price. Two weeks later, 
the mark was devalued and they couldn't buy a loaf of bread with the money that they had gotten. Treasury Secretary Timothy F. Geithner and Austin Goolsby, members of the Council of Economic Advisors, have refused to rule out a global currency. Such views by top policymakers caused the dollars to drop. Even worse, this shows that the Obama administration supports dramatically greater centralization on a national and international scale. London Telegraph, March 25, 2009, U.S. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner confessed on Wednesday that he had not read the plans by China's central bank governor for a, quote, super sovereign reserve currency. In other words, not controlled by any government, but being controlled by an international body. Nevertheless, let slip, he let slip that Washington was, quote, open to the idea. Now, what's interesting is the day before, Michelle Bachman had asked him and Bernanke in front of the Senate, are you planning on going off the dollar for a, an international reserve currency? And he said, we have absolutely no plans to do that. The next day, he's telling the, bank of board, the Board of Bank Governors that we all know that obviously this is where it's going to go. So I'm not saying he talks out of both sides of his mouth. I think it comes out of other orifices, but basically... I don't know what's so funny. Anyway, uh, but anyway, uh, as I was saying, uh, he goes on to say, China's suggestion, backed by Russia, Brazil, and India, and clearly aimed at breaking U.S. dollar hegemony, is making its way onto the agenda of the G20 summit next week. Dollar Damarung, which means dusk or the basically sunset, the sunset of the dollar, no longer looks so far-fetched. Financial Times, October 2010. The Institute of International Finance, a group that represents 420 of the, international, of the world's largest banks and financial houses, has issued yet another call for a one-world global currency. Dallard, who's the chairman of the international, uh, Institute of International Finance, encouraged a return to the G20 commitment. They've already made the commitment to utilize international monetary funds, special drawing rights, to create an international one-world currency alternative to the U.S. dollar as a new standard of foreign exchange reserves. Likewise, a July United Nations report called for the replacement of the dollar as the standard for holding uh, foreign currency exchanges in international trade with a new one-world currency issued by the International Monetary Fund. So uh, what I'm trying to really illustrate here is that this is not a new idea. This is not a far-fetched idea. This is something that is in the works. It's, it's, it's everybody's accepting it, and it has huge implications to your and my standard of living. Last January, uh, in 2011, the beginning of the year, one year ago from next month, in Davos, Switzerland, which is the host annually of the World Economic Forum. Uh, the World Economic Forum it consists of bankers, CEOs, and, and governmental leaders from the top 1,000 corporations from various places around the world. I mean, it is a who's who meeting of the powerful and the elite. In their 2011 meeting, it included a magazine that they gave to every attendant with an article written by Robert Rubens, who used to be under President Clinton, the uh, Secretary of Treasury. He is now on the Economic Advisor Board for President Obama on the economy. He's considered by many to be one of the most influential men who is advising the U.S. administration on economic issues today. This is what he said in the article he wrote. He says, the risks of our fiscal position are serious and multiple. And while these risks become more severe over time as our debt position worsens, all of these either have begun to materialize or could do so in the very near future. So we should act now. To be specific, the risks, deficits could crowd out private investments which could choke off a private investment recovery. In other words, business can't 
expand if it can't get capital, and if the government is sucking all the excess capital to support government programs, then there's nothing left, there's no monies left for businesses to expand. I mean, you understand that? I mean, it, it's really kind of a simple idea, really. But he goes on to say, moreover, the capacity for public investment is already diminishing and could be exasperated by the growing entitlement costs and mounting interest payments. Now, I don't know if I can get this to go in reverse. Let's see if I can go in reverse. What is he talking about? Well, this is a pie chart, a simplified pie chart of the U.S. government spending today. And notice some of the things that we, we have on here. Uh, 21% of our income, the U.S. government's income that takes in taxes and other things, 21% goes to Social Security. 21% of our economy goes to funds for Social Security. This year is the first time that the cost of Social Security was 5% higher than the revenues that came in for Social Security. And every year it's going to continue to go up by at least 5%. Okay, So this is 21% of our economy just goes to Social Security payments and it's going to continue to grow in deficit numbers, become increasingly a larger percentage of the pie. 21% goes to Medicare, Medicaid, and, and other social entitlement programs. In fact, this particular piece of the economy is going to grow even faster under Obamacare. It's going to explode beyond anything we can even imagine because of all that's promised. So that here you go. Now we've got 42% of the economy. This is set by law. Your legislatures can't do anything about this. I mean, they have to write laws that reduce what we pay in these things. They have to mandate it. It's not like, why didn't the Congress just cut that? They can't. And can you imagine what happens when congressmen, somebody puts in a bill saying, let's reduce uh, Social Security? Hmm, the phones ring off the hook. <laughs> the emails of computers catch on fire. People go nuts because I want my Social Security. I have to live it. I'm counting on this. Well, I understand that. But... So anybody who talks about cutting the budget, you've got to realize 42% is out. Then you talk about defense and security. 22% of the entire budget goes to defense. How about um, safety net programs? There's all sorts of things like unemployment insurance. Now we've expanded it two years. People want to have it be indefinite. 9%, almost a tenth of our economy, goes to pay for that. Interest on the debt that we borrow money is 9%. Almost a tenth of our income is paying interest, not principal, just the interest. You see, we're not paying down the debt, we're just paying the interest payments, interest only. Remember on your credit card, if you pay the minimum payment, what happens? It, the debt gets bigger and bigger because you... And see, right now it's only 9%. You know why? Because we're able to borrow the money at almost no interest at all. We're borrowing money at 1% and 2% interest. What happens if they begin to say, you know what? You're not really a good credit risk. I don't know how many of you pe people even notice when Standard & Poor's said, well, we're going to take away the A+, plus, the AAA plus rating in the United States, and we're just going to make them double A and say, oh, it doesn't really make any difference. The problem is, at some point, when everybody starts saying, well, you know, we don't see you as a good credit risk, what happens is you have to pay higher interest. That's the way it works in the banking world, right? Governments are no different than individuals. They just get away with it longer. So basically, if we start having to pay 5% interest, this goes from being 9% to being 15%. The pie doesn't get bigger, it gets smaller. How much discretionary income is there that Congress can cut? Right here, 18%. So when you say to your congressman, I want you to see the cut the, cut the interest or the, cut the, the debt and cut the, all this stuff, they can only have 8%, 18%, and they fight like cats and dogs over that 18%. 82% of the budget is non discretionary. Coming soon, there's going to be 77 million baby boomers retiring. And the obligation for Social Security is going to go to 70, 
77, or excuse me, $4 billion per year for just this added increase in cost. It just keeps on going up and keeps on going up and keeps on going up so that the long-range forecast for Medicaid and Social Security is something like $45 trillion. Our entire net worth in the U.S. is $15 trillion. So the obligation, and that's what never gets talked about, what are we obligated to pay with all the promises to you and me who are in that age group? The obligation basically is, is three times the entire network of the country. And this is the problem we have because Congress is arguing over cutting the budget. The Republicans want to cut it by 1.62%, which is basically equivalent to how much foreign aid we give every year. The Democrats want to cut it by 0.28%. Two-tenths of one percent is all. And they're arguing like cats and dogs. Why am I not hopeful? <laughs> well, the article goes on to say, well, let me see. I think I've got another one here that may relate. Here's basically, it gives you another perspective. This pie represents the income. This pie represents the expense. Do you notice the difference in size? How long does this work? <laughs> <laughs> it, bottom line is that if you're only bringing in this much money and you're spending this much, at some point, the bottom has to fall out. Well, anyway, Rubens goes on to write to the economic leaders of the world. Most dangerously, he says, there is a risk of disruption to our bond and currency markets from fear of much higher interest rates due to future imbalances or from fear of inflation because of its efforts to monetize our debt. In other words, because we're printing so much extra money, when we try to go into the world market and sell our debt, 